Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts bless your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, it was maybe 14 years ago, right here in this room, although the room was a little different back then. Uh, this wall was not here, and this platform was back in that corner. This room was twice the size. Uh, and it was in the middle of the week, and maybe 20 of us were sprawled all over the place. Some were kneeling in front of chairs, and some were, were kneeling over steps, and some were lying prostrate on the ground and on the platform. Our prayers were desperate. We were desperate. We had seen uh, more people leaving the church during that year than we had seen previously. And for the third year in a row, we were significantly behind financially, like way behind. We were facing major cuts. And so together we were begging God not to let our church die. We were pleading with God to provide for us. And we did this every week for months. Different people uh, would pray one after another, and it was all the same sort of prayer, right? There were, there were tears and there was fear. And, and then one week, at least for me and in my experience, one prayer helped break me free from the despair. It, it was a psalm. And, and someone read it that night uh, during their turn, and they read it from an unfamiliar translation, so it's, it really stuck out to me. And as it was read, I heard a different sort of spirit speaking. This wasn't a spirit of fear, but a, a spirit of deep trust. And, and not just trust that God would provide financial resources if we begged hard enough, but trust that God was good no matter what happened. This psalm gave me a new language for my prayers, uh, for my faith, and I started to embrace the possibility that our church could die and that that would be okay. Congregations come and go. They serve for a season. But God's church remains unshaken, regardless of what happens to a single congregation. God remains. And for the first time in a couple of years, I started to dream about the kind of ministry that God might have us to do, a ministry that wasn't just a frantic attempt at saving the church or to keep us from dying. Um, over the next few years, I would personally, just in my prayer life, start reading the Psalms daily and, and beginning to learn how to pray them. Um, and then with some spiritual guides like C.S. Lewis and Walter Brueggemann and Eugene Peterson, um, each with their own books on the Psalms, my prayers just began to take on new forms. New language started to fill my prayer life all of it coming from the Psalms. And I found myself in this season with a renewed faith, with a, a deeper trust that God remains, no matter what happens, no matter the circumstances in our lives. On Thursday night, uh, we gathered for worship, like this Thursday night, not, not like 14 years ago Thursday night, with people from all over Northern California as part of our, our annual district assembly. Um, we sang in English, we sang in Spanish, we prayed together in like seven or eight different languages. There were, there were three mini sermons, legit mini sermons, uh, you know, not lo three long ones that were supposed to be mini sermons, but like legit mini ones from pastors from different countries. It was beautiful. And the second sermon, uh, was from a Korean pastor. And she talked about learning to pray. When she grew up in South Korea, her church would gather for prayer. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. In the morning, 
at 5.30. <laughs> I love the gasp. I heard an audible gasp. She, she, to, she told us she never took a class on prayer. She never read a book on prayer. She caught prayer by being with people who prayed. She was never taught it. And, and this connected with me as I listened to her. N nobody taught me to pray with the Psalms. I was just praying with people and then someone read a Psalm as a prayer and I recognized it as a prayer and I, then I just tried it out for myself. And this pastor's testimony connected with me as I reflected on all the people that I've prayed with through the years, right? All of the prayer meetings at the camp where I became a follower of Jesus, my friend who had been a Christian for years, who was the most solid Christian in our group, often did the praying for us in our cabin times. Father God was the phrase I learned from him. I had never heard it before. I had never heard somebody pray Father God in their prayers, but I remember trying it on as I then prayed alone on my own. Oh, over the next few years, um, I would pick up lots of phrases. Some of them I would pick up without realizing. They just started sort of popping out. Uh, and some of them I would hear and they would make me think deeply about who God is and why someone might pray that thing. And then I might deliberately try to pray it on my own to see how it might shape my faith and my relationship with God. And, and sometimes I, I would hear things in prayer and maybe you've had this experience. I, I would try not to pray those things because I listened and maybe it, it just felt a little shallow or empty or like a little cliche. I noticed through the years that one of the ways that you can tell if you are learning uh, or, or growing in your faith, in your understanding of God, is the degree to which your prayers change over time. If you're praying with the same phrases and words and same structure, if your prayers sound the same today as they did 10 years ago, it's worth asking whether you are learning new things about who God is learning from others who might teach you how to pray. Do you pray with the same canned phrases every time you pray? Uh, do you ever purposely try on new language as you learn new things about God and God's will? Have you ever let the Psalms shape your prayers? How about the Lord's Prayer? And think about the Lord's Prayer, right? Jesus' disciples come to him, the passage we just heard in Luke 11, and they ask him, teach us how to pray. And so Jesus gives them this brief outline to follow. Uh, this is the uh, English Standard Version. We heard the Common English Bible, the congregational set, a few minutes ago. But in the ESV, we hear, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Now this is more than just an outline. <clears throat> Jesus is giving his disciples language, deep and rich vocabulary that will open their lives up before God in unexpected ways. Jesus tells us to pray for our daily bread. And then he goes on, as we heard in our passage, to share a story about going to a friend in the middle of the night to beg for bread. And Jesus urges us to be persistent in prayer. Uh, the CEB said brashness. Um, the uh, ESV, uh, oh, I don't have it in front of me. I forget what it says. But basically, and I, I heard this guy who thought, oh, yeah, he's just annoying. So persistent, right? Um, Jesus is basically saying, be that. Not giving up until we get what we are asking for. He tells us to ask and it will be given to us. And then reminds us that, that God is our Father who is eager to give good gifts to his children. It was... It was passages like this 
that had our church on our knees right here in this room pleading with God to provide for us. We were asking for money to pay our pastors so we could feed our families. We were asking for God to bring people to us so that we could help them find Jesus. We were asking God to save our church. And we were asking the question along the way, why isn't God answering our prayers? Were we not desperate enough? Did we not ask loud enough? or long enough? Were we not annoying enough? But I think this might be a, a powerful example of, of what we explored together last week, that you can read the Bible and not hear from God, be disconnected from God's will. See, in, in a respect, like we were busy trying to use the Bible to get what we thought we needed, but we were missing God's heart. We were missing the will and the way of Jesus in that moment because for far too long, we knew it. Our church had been living beyond our means. And, and, and truthfully, our church was not healthy. There were far too many toxic relationships. There was dissension and there was gossip among us. And truthfully, we didn't really have a reason to exist. At least we didn't have a shared sense of why we were around. We weren't actively making disciples of Jesus. And so in that place, we were praying for more than just our daily bread. And we were asking for something more like a serpent or a scorpion than a good gift. See, for the last two weeks, we've been talking about the devil's lies. Lies are the primary tool that the devil uses to wreck love and to keep us from the work that God made us for. And, and just as the devil shows up to Jesus in the wilderness, quoting scripture, misusing scripture, to try to get Jesus away from the Father's heart, so I think the devil had done the same for us. But where Jesus knew the Father's heart, we were listening to the devil and we got distracted over a long period of time so that like the Israelites in the wilderness, we stumbled and we fell and we wandered and sinned. I remember the very first time we were in a board meeting together where the conversation moved past the possibility that our church could die to the suggestion that maybe should die. There was a sort of quiet hush that fell over us. What if the end of our church was actually a gracious gift from God? I mean, if we didn't have a clear reason or purpose to exist, if, if we weren't interested, really committed to growing in love and holiness, if we didn't want to heal the broken relationships, if we only just wanted to keep existing, right? Keeping our church alive wouldn't be good for anyone. It, it would be a scorpion for us, for our neighbors, and for the world. I still pray a list of people or for a list of people who were hurt by us during those years. Which leads us to an interesting question. So why are we here today, 14 years later? Right? I mean, it's a fair question, it's an important one. And, and I wish I had a, you know, a word from the Lord, a clear one. But the best I can come up with is that God has generously given us another season of ministry, of life together. I can't tell you how long this season will last, but I do believe that God answered our prayers, specifically when we started praying, forgive us our sins. The, the Lord's prayer named for us a reality that we didn't want to face. We had sinned against God's purpose for the church. Uh, no, we didn't 
need a, a, some big scandal or pastoral failing. Our, our sin was just being lived out daily by all of us in, in our division, in our refusal to grow spiritually, in our lack of engagement in God's mission. We, we weren't dying because God was killing our church. We were quietly dying as we killed his church. And the scriptures revealed this truth to us. When we listened to Jesus, his truth overcame the lies of the devil. And then we started praying the truth with our mouths and with our hearts. So we asked for forgiveness from God and each other. We prayed for God's kingdom to come in us and through us. And then we let him begin to use us. And we ask God to grow love in us, to make us holy like Christ. And we, we devoted ourselves to becoming holy as he is holy. We worked to restore relationships. We started using our, our resources wisely. But most important, we just set out to be faithful to God and God's purposes for his church. We asked forgiveness and we turned from our sinful ways, which wasn't a guarantee that he would let us keep going, but God did forgive us and heal us. Thanks be to God. The lies of the devil are powerful. They often come to us wrapped in chapter and verse, but as we learn to recognize the voice of our Father, as we know Jesus, because we are with Jesus. As we recognize the movement of the Holy Spirit, we find that his truth overcomes the devil's lies. But it's not enough to simply recognize the truth. We need to speak it. We have to, to stop praying lies and we need to pray truth instead. And remember, lies sometimes can sound almost true, but just be twisted just enough. There's something about working the truth into our prayers in increasing ways that, that our lives just begin to change. We imagine our lives differently. We imagine our relationship with God differently. When I learned Early on in my faith, because of this friend, this Christian friend who prayed, Father God, when I learned to call God Father, my life began to change in significant ways. I saw God in a new light. I saw my own dad in a new light. But I, I didn't just see them differently. I interacted with them differently. The, the lies of the devil that to told me that, that I was unloved, that I was unworthy, that I was forgotten, that I had been abandoned. These were being undone in my prayers to God as Father. As I, as I called God Father, I learned to trust that I had been adopted into a family, that I was known and chosen and loved and embraced even while I was still in my sin. That invitation came to me. Every year, I pray a very specific prayer for us on Mother's Day. You might recall it. I prayed it last week. I do this because there are so many lies, some wrapped in chapter and verse that come directly from the devil. And so I pray the truth. And year after year, People thank me for naming their experience and their grief and their disappointment and their guilt and for some, their happiness. See, the devil wants us to believe that motherhood is the highest calling, but it's not. The devil wants us to generically thank and celebrate all moms, but this is a hard word. Some moms are not good moms. And we just need to be honest about that. And then the devil wants good moms to feel guilty. Like they aren't enough. Like they don't do enough and aren't home enough. And, and so that they feel like failures. 
And then there are those who struggle with the loss of their moms and others who wonder what's wrong with them because their moms abandoned them and still others who wonder what's wrong with them because they've tried to have kids for years and can't. The devil lives in nice cliches and Mother's Day is like a cliche on steroids. But the truth is infinitely more complex and beautiful and inviting as the truth invites us to the one who is the source of all truth. And while our world throws a party and generically says, Happy Mother's Day to everyone, we, we pray the truth that we learned from God, that there are no perfect mothers. But God, in whose image mothers were made, we find the perfect mother. And I know that in a season of my life, I've shared this with you before, learning to see and to call God mother in my prayers was really powerful. A gift that opened up my relationship with God and helped me find my own healing. And so where do you need to start praying the truth. Are some of your prayers filled with even just little lies? Things that are mostly true, but just twisted. Maybe your prayers are filled with empty phrases that you picked up along the way, but you, you just haven't really thought about them in a long time. Maybe little things that sound true, but with a little discernment you would realize are really the devil's effort to deceive you. Are your prayers filled with requests for things that just won't satisfy? What would change in your life if you could pray with your whole mind, attentive, learning from the Psalms, praying the Lord's Prayer, listening to the saints around you, so that your conversations with God are growing and evolving and reflect a, a real relationship with someone that you are actively engaging with and learning from day to day. As a as a thing to take away this morning, as a thing to keep considering. Two final questions. Maybe what's one prayer that you might need to stop praying today? Because it's not true. And what's one prayer that today you're going to start intentionally adding to your prayer life? And maybe the Lord's Prayer might point you in a direction. We're gonna to come to the table this morning. Uh, and as we do, we'll let Jesus pray for us again. So we'll listen. Uh, these are the words that Jesus prayed with his disciples around the table as he prepared to leave and head into the garden where he would continue to pray as he prepared to suffer and die for you and for me. Our, our team's gonna come and I just invite you to, to hear Jesus praying for us. And, and maybe here uh, you'll find some truth that needs to make its way into your prayers. So this comes from John 17. Jesus prays, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son can glorify you. You gave me authority over everyone so that I could give eternal life to everyone you gave me. This is eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I have glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I shared with you before the world was created. I have revealed your name to the people you gave me from this world. 
They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. This is because I gave them the words that you gave me and they received them. They truly understood that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you gave me because they are yours. Everything that is mine is yours and everything that is yours is mine. I have been glorified in them. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Even as I am coming to you, Holy Father, watch over them in your name, the name you gave me, that they will be one just as we are one. When I was with them, I watched over them in your name, the name you gave to me. I kept them safe. None of them were lost except the one who is destined for destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Now I'm coming to you and I say these things while I'm in the world so that they can share completely in my joy. I gave your word to them and the world hated them because they don't belong to this world just as I don't belong to this world. I'm not asking you take them out of this world, but that you keep them safe from the evil one. They don't belong to this world just as I don't belong to this world. Make them holy in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. I made myself holy on their behalf so that they also would be made holy in the truth. I'm not praying only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their word. I pray they will be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I pray that they will be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me so that they can be one just as we are. I'm in them and you are in me so that they will be made perfectly one. Then the world will know that you sent me and that you have loved them just as you loved me. Father, I want those you, you gave me to be with me where I am. Then they can see my glory, which you gave me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, even the world didn't know you, but I've known you. And these believers know that you sent me. I've made your name known to them and will continue to make it known so that your love for me will be in them and I myself will be in them.